get this afternoon's session um, started. Uh, my name is uh, Ben Powell, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm a theorist here in the Department of Physics and the Center for Organic Photonics and Electronics. Um, uh, so this afternoon we're going to have a series of uh, tutorials on, on some basic aspects of photovoltaics. Um, and uh, the first speaker from the organizers is Sean Chimene. Good morning, everyone. Can we turn the lights down? So following the very interesting uh, panel discussion this morning, we'll now begin the more technical aspects of the, of the workshop. So my, my talk is very uh, introductory, and it's very much an overview. So uh, I want to apologize first of all to the experts in the audience. Uh, if you want to uh, check email or prepare uh, some other work, that will not be my But for those of you who do not have a background in OPD, I, I hope this provides a good overview of what we'll, we'll see um, throughout the rest of the week. So, and, and much of what I discussed will be a result of collaborations with the real experts that have been that are in the audience. Uh, so, I'm a faculty at the University of Denver, and I'm now a subcontractor at Denver, where I have worked full time for five years, but still work very closely with that institution. So, I've got a couple of things I'd like to talk to you today about, actually, quite a few. And uh, I also apologize, I'm going to race through a little bit of the material. But you'll have it as a PDF file if you need to look at it later, later on. So I'll start with a very broad uh, set of slides that sort of stems off of the discussion we had earlier this week. Talk a little bit, a bit about global energy and, and some of our needs and what OPD might do for it. Um, then I'll go into excitons and what role excitons play in the device behavior uh, in, in these OPD devices. I'll talk then about molecular morphology and we'll do it here several talks over the next couple of days on molecular morphology and the role it plays in transport, recombination, and the device physics. Uh, a little bit about material design, and this will segue into Friday's computational chemistry workshop, uh, where Professor Jeff Reimers will give you a hands-on uh, opportunity to do some calculations. I'll show you some of the things we've done, in particular looking at low band gap polymers. And then finally, just a few slides on how we can get the efficiencies in these devices a little bit higher. So during this morning's discussion, it was mentioned that the total uh, power consumption of the globe right now is about 14 terawatts. So you can see a publication by Nate Lewis and Dan Nocera uh, back in 06 that sort of highlighted it. And this was under the context of the terawatt challenge, right? So this is the major challenge that we're facing. So in 2000, our consumption was about 13 terawatts. So the number 14 for 2010 is about right. And it's projected that by 2050, that number will grow to be about 30 terawatts. So uh, we can break down the existing consumption, of course, largely into fossil fuel-derived power, oil, gas, and coal, with a little bit of hydro and a very tiny sliver of, of renewable, uh, which is mainly wind. So we need to fill the rest of this blank spot, and we'd like to do that with, with something renewable. And uh, by the way, uh, Dan and, and Nate had used some, some numbers to calculate this total energy figure. Um, so you can see the paper for more, more details. So why, why solar? Well, we do have a tremendous resource in solar globally. And on this resource map, uh, dark red or, or the, the brownish indicates higher insulation, these little green squares equate to the area, the land area required um, for all the electricity use for, in this case, for the United States. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have the numbers for Australia on me, but so this one here is about 100 kilometers on the side, so 10,000 square kilometers. And if we were to cover that with solar cells at a 15% efficient uh, device, that would give all of the electricity needs for the US. And I put, put these on the globe at various places in North Africa, North and North Australia, and South America, um, just to illustrate that, of course, we can do this everywhere. Uh, what amazes me about this, this particular plot is, is North Africa, and just how much solar insulation is in um, the Gobi Desert, so or the Sahara Desert. So that, that's really amazing, actually. Uh, if you want to see more of this type of thing, I, I direct you to the NREL homepage, where there's an analysis group that spends uh, all their time developing such charts and, and useful information. So a little, bit, a little bit about the PV industry in general. Of course, we've seen tremendous growth in the PV industry. So uh, this past year, 2009, there's been about seven gigawatts of solar panels generated in the world. Um, that's projected to grow over the next 15 years by something like a factor of four. So tremendous growth, something like 30 to 40% per capita growth in, in production. 
The largest solar cell manufacturer in the world today is First Solar. This is a company in Ohio, Toledo, Ohio. And uh, they make cadmium telluride devices. So that's a bit of a new thing that CadTel has taken over the market so rapidly. Uh, traditionally, of course, uh, crystalline and polycrystalline silicon has, has dominated. If you look at the rest of these companies, most of these are in China. So China has taken over global protection, uh, production leadership in, in most of the silicon um, technologies. So the question is, uh, can OPB provide a piece of that pie? Um, in order to do that, we really need to talk about cost. So we can talk about efficiency and, and, and production rates. In the end, it's, it's the cost of the technology that will dominate. So the discussion with Professor Foster in terms of economics, uh, in the end, that is the metric we need. So uh, an aggressive goal, one that, one that um, will be difficult to achieve, but, but is our sort of our litmus test, is about 30 cents per pequot. And so the W sub P there, that means per pequot. And uh, that's sort of the figure bear for, for organic PV at present. So what does that mean in terms of what we have now? Well, First Solar, the Cattel company, is, is, has a cost, a production cost, of 83 cents per pequot. So it's actually uh, not too far away from, from that goal. So what does that mean in terms of what you need to buy the, the product, the, the current sales price? Well, you can go to this homepage, solarbuzz.com, and get monthly updates on all the prices of different, uh, different technologies. So in the US, if you average all the different technologies and different companies, you get about 20, cents, 20 US cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and if you compare that to the cost of the fossil fuel derived electricity, which is about 10 cents, there's about a factor of two in there between the solar, um, solar and fossil fuel derived. So uh, on the solar buzz, they break down the technologies, the cost by technologies, and you look at the thin film module cost, and that is CAD tell again. And the module cost now is something below, just below one dollar per pequot. So very encouraging results, and that number has been dropping very rapidly over the last um, the last several months. So this thirty cents per pequot that's aggressive goal, but uh, it seems like uh, it can it can be done. So I'm not going to talk too much about economics. I'm going to talk more about science. But uh, why OPV? Well, there's a lot of reasons, and a lot of people have recognized those reasons. So if you do a quick search in the scientific literature, if you look at the Web of Science database, and just look under the keyword, organic photovoltaic, the key phrase, you get about 3,000 hits. And if you plot those publications over time, which is sort of a fun thing people like to do, uh, you get this sort of exponential growth in publications over the last oh, 25 years, 35 years. Um, in fact, if you plot a log linear, you see a straight line, so it actually is an exponential growth some sort of complexity uh, occurring in that, in that system. So a lot of people working on this. Um, we were discussing er earlier about what's the total number of researchers in the world who work on OPV. We don't quite know the number, but I'm guessing it's a few thousand, something like this, uh, maybe a couple thousand. So a pretty substantial effort. So why are they excited? Well, recently there's been, there's been quite a bit of progress, uh, first of all, in the efficiencies. So there, there have been a number of groups, mainly at companies, that are reporting efficiencies greater than 70%. Uh, a lot of those companies I list here, so Canarca is a polymer fluorine based company, Plextronix uh, similarly, Solar, a polymer based company, Heliotech, small molecule company, a German company, Polygera, a polymer company. So all these companies are producing very nice efficiency devices. Um, as well, the lifetimes that are being reported are getting much better. And in some cases, we're seeing reported lifetimes in tens of thousands of hours. So uh, that's obviously a big concern with any technology, but particularly with plastic, that you're putting this plastic material in the sunlight. Uh, what is the degradation rate? Well, it turns out that if you do the engineering correctly, you can improve some of the problems. Uh, very encouraging is initial efforts of large-scale production. So uh, Canarca, for instance, has a plant in, in uh, Connecticut, uh, sorry, in Massachusetts, that is capable of one gigawatt per year of production. Um, so you saw that last year we produced about 7 gigawatts globally, so this OPD company has the capability to, to do about one-seventh of that in a single plant. So uh, now they're not, they haven't reached that full potential yet, but that capability is there. Um, another important thing that has happened is that a lot of these companies are producing the inks, or the polymer blends, uh, that one can use in your own research. So this provides a good reproducible source of material that we can all uh, take hold, we can investigate. So that's a very important for the field, that we have these sort of reproducible 
large-scale materials. Um, and finally, we can talk about the active layer, the light-absorbing stuff, which is mainly what the rest of my talk was about. But there's all the balance of system material costs, so electrodes and capsulins, support materials. And there are industries growing in all those areas as well. Uh, 3M, for instance, has gotten into the field and uh, trying to reduce the cost for all those things. So a lot of encouraging things happening. So uh, where are we now? Well, you can buy OPD products today. Uh, if you go to the, um, you go to a German company, uh, Noon Solar, and you can buy this bag. It is about 100 euro. Um, let's see. The largest uh, OPB demonstration project in the world is a bus stop in uh, San Francisco. And actually, I've stolen this picture from Professor Homeland, who will speak uh, later this week. And uh, he took a picture of this from, from the bus stop. So thank, thank you, guys. Um, Canark is also selling these, these tents where you can just get sort of flexible power on the tent and use that for various outdoor applications. So these are all things that are really in the world. There's this company, SolarIV.com, which is producing these sort of leaves, uh, which you can put on the side of your building and uh, make a nice architectural feature. So what the, the power efficiency of this is, I'm not sure, but it is, it's, it's kind of cute. I believe this is also a, a Canarca technology. So uh, Mitsubishi, the big Japanese firm, is in the game, and uh, one of the things people like to do when you have a new solar technology is to form it into the shape of a plant or a tree, just to emphasize the point. So they've done this, they've got the solar plant, and uh, this is some kind of OPD material, which I'm not sure what the active layer material actually is. Um, the military is very interested in, uh, in these products for uh, uh, power generation and camouflage, for instance. And then a new one that's come, come online is this sort of consumer clothing, uh, some sort of solar-powered outfits that you can wear and power all of your iPods and iPhones at the same time. Um, I think that's also another Canarca, Canarca product. So part of the appeal of OPD is the diversity of products and the ingenuity that, that can come out of, uh, out of these materials. Uh, another big one is a building integrated PV. Uh, this is a picture from a, from a Solarmer um, publication. And uh, one of the ideas is that you can tailor the color of the device by the chroma 4 you choose, uh, with an obvious trade-off and potential efficiency, but make something that's uh, aesthetically pleasing for, for building integration. Okay, so that's sort of this, the sales pitch. Um, as I said, you can go right now and buy some of this stuff, but mainly it's just uh, curiosity and, and consumer electronics. Uh, we'd like to get to the point of large-scale generation, so that's, that's going to be the, the brunt of, um, of our discussions. So if you're unfamiliar with the field, just a quick uh, rundown on the, on the architecture of the device. So these are thin film materials. Uh, the active layer is typically about 200 nanometers thick. So we mentioned earlier in the discussion how much material is needed to uh, produce a solar cell. It's a very small amount. You need about 100 milligrams of material to cover a square meter. Okay, so a very small amount. And this is facilitated by the large optical cross-section of organic chromophores. The oscillator strength is very high. Uh, much higher than in crystalline silicon, where the active layer is something like 20 to 50 microns in thickness. So uh, we have a very, a truly thin film technology. So sandwiched on either side of that are various uh, cladding layers. So a typical one will be uh, indium tin oxide for the transparent conductor, conducting polymer or P-dot PSS. So that would be the, the positive side of the device. And then on the negative side, we'll have typically a reactive metal. Here I have lithium fluoride aluminum, which we've sort of gone away from and, and now would use probably calcium for that side of the device. Uh, here's a cross-sectional TEM taken by colleagues at Sandia, uh, showing this glass, ITO, active layer. This is a little bit of actually oxidized aluminum. There's aluminum and that's some epoxy. So we have a couple different ways we can make the devices. What I just showed you, I'll call a normal device, where the, the, the negative electrode is on top, so the electrons come from the top. Uh, we can reverse that and make an inverted device. And in this case, we'll take the positive charges from the top and, and the negative from the bottom. Uh, there is a lot of interest commercially in the inverted structure because it uh, obviates the need for the low work function electrode. So in this case, the metal is a high work function material, like silver, which actually oxidizes the silver oxide. Um, and then on the other side, we again stick with ITO, but we have, we have an oxide interlayer, typically zinc oxide, that preferentially uh, switches the direction of the device around. So electrons come this way, and, and holes go that way. Um, just to make a definition here, if you're not a chemist, we have 
for the active layer, we can define the highest occupied molecular orbital, the HOMO, and then the, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And these are of two different materials, right? So this is for the acceptor of, of the HOMO is of the acceptor, the HOMO is of the donor. So we have these two structures. The physics is the same, but this one is a little more viable commercially, and maybe the lifetime would be a little bit better. Uh, in case you're not a solar cell physicist, I'll just go through this very briefly. Uh, so we can define several parameters from our JD curve. We want to find the crossing of the, of the current axis as the short circuit current, IFC, and the crossing of the horizontal axis as the open circuit voltage, the VOC. And we can define the power output as um, the power at maximum power point, taken here, uh, divided by the incident light power on the device. And we have this quantity, the fill factor, which describes sort of the, um, the quality of the diode and how much of a right angle we can form with that curve. So we'd like, ideally, a complete right angle with a fill factor of, of 1 or 100%. Here's a typical curve you would see from a device from the sort of the workhorse materials in the field, the poly 3 hexyl thiophenes, <coughs> the and then the fully derived the PCDM. And I should say that the experts on uh, this material is sitting right there, and experts on these materials are also in the audience, so uh, I have to tread lightly here. But um, these devices will get you about 4% uh, efficiency. So typically a VOC of about 0.6 and a short circuit current density of about 10. And to make a good device, you get a fill factor of 70%, so roughly 4%. So these set of materials are the workhorse because you can buy them. They're relatively expensive. You can buy them in large quantity. And uh, this provides a good working set to understand a lot of physics. But none of the companies are really working on these materials, but they moved on to more advanced materials. So um, one of the attractions of OPD is the, is the plethora of materials that we have access to, of course. And um, you can look at this review paper back in the energy environment in 2009 to give you an example of all the materials. And um, so starting with sort of the PPD and P uh, PPD materials that were the, the first generation, things have evolved to more thiazine-based materials. And then now people are looking at copolymers, so mixing uh, different modes in the backbone to tune the optical electronic properties. And I'll talk more about those as we go into the material design section. Um, most of the materials here are donor materials. That is, they absorb light, they give a hold to the acceptor. And um, we have a little bit of a problem in the field that we don't have quite as many acceptors as we would like. But uh, you'll hear more about that from Professor Homelon later in the week. But, um, Right now, mainly C60 and higher fullerene provide the bulk of those, of those acceptors. Now, what I just showed you was in one realm of OPD, which are solution processable or polymer based. The second realm are small molecule devices, which typically are not solution processed but thermally evaporated or through some vapor deposition process. And we have a number of chromophores here. We have uh, porphyrins and thalassinines that have a metal core, we have uh, perylene materials and then just um, cyclo-aromatic compounds that act as donor materials. And again, C60 shows up as a strong acceptor um, in the small molecule realm as well. So uh, these two sets of materials are processed in different ways, but the physics of their operation is, is very much the same. Uh, one last point is that when we go towards manufacturing, we can look at a number of different uh, processes for putting on a thin film. And here we can leverage some of the expertise of the printing industry that has been developed over the last 200 years. And all of the techniques in terms of knife blading and um, doctor blading and gravure printing um, and inkjet printing can be applied and have been applied to OPV materials. So each of the companies is investigating which technique is best for their material and their process and all with the goal of getting very high speed throughput. Um, and again, I ref refer you to this publication for more, more on that topic. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the overview in terms of um, cost and manufacturing. So let's talk a little bit about the physics. So this is, this is a very famous slide. Uh, this is one of the first slides that really described the photophysics of the process. Um, I got this from my advisor in, in Linz, Sadar Sarachichi, and uh, I believe he got that from his postdoctoral advisor, Alan Heger, in Santa Barbara. So, and now I'm, I'm going to you. Uh, the idea is that uh, we have this combination of donor acceptor materials. We start with the conjugate of the polymer, in this case a phenyl background. We excite an exciton on that backbone. And if there is an acceptor species nearby, and by nearby we mean O nanometer, 
then within a very short time, there is electron transfer to, this, to the acceptor, and we get a metastable charge separated state. So the, the rate of that transfer has been measured, or it was measured um, about 10 years ago to be close to 50 femtoseconds. So it's truly an ultra fast process. The reverse reaction, where that electron would come back and you'd get a recombination of the electron with a positive pole rod that was left on the polymer, that's a much slower process. And at room temperature, that's about one microsecond, depending on a lot of factors. So in fact, it's the asymmetry between these two rates, which is something like a factor of a million, that provides the driving force uh, for, for the device. So uh, one good way to examine the physics of these devices is through a kinetic diagram. And uh, I have borrowed this from uh, Gary Rumbles, who uh, he's not sitting here now. So he's a physical chemist, a spectroscopist, and uh, he convinced me that kinetics is the appropriate way to view the processes in a device. So we'll start with a donor material that we excite. Here's our exciton, the D star. Then we have several different processes that can occur. We can give off a photon. We can just quench the ground state. Or hopefully we can diffuse that exciton to an interface with an acceptor at which point there is a series of steps that occurs where that exciton is delocalized across both donor and receptor. Then there is a partial charge separation of a, a delta plus and a delta minus. And then finally, hopefully, a complete charge separation and transport to the electrodes. So we want to avoid these processes and drive this process to completion with, uh, with high efficiency. So going back to the exciton issue, um, again, this has been measured. This was uh, measured by uh, Christoph Robetz back in, in about 10 years ago. And uh, just, I give you the data so you can, so you can see it. It was, it was done with pump probe spectroscopy. And taking the blend of uh, phenylene polymer and the C60 acceptor, you look at uh, delta T over T, the transient uh, transmission in this case. Uh, what you see at uh, very early times, and this is, a, this is increasing time going down, is first a bleaching of the polymer. So you've overexcited the number of states and you get extra transmission. But very rapidly you get growth of uh, delta T is going negative or some absorption. So that absorption is from the polarized state that you've created in the polymer. So you create a positive polarized state, it absorbs, and you can detect that state. So if you pick a specific wavelength, in this case 580 nanometers, and look at that signal, um, this is without the addition of fullerene or acceptor, this is with the fullerene you see a dramatic drop in the lifetime of 45 femtoseconds. So that's a direct measure of this, of this electron transfer rate. So this brings us to the topic of exotons. Um, and this is the defining characteristic of these devices. They can be called exotonic devices. So what is the nature of the exoton? Well, first of all, when you have these isolated molecules, uh, all by itself it has um, uh, two states. There's an ionization state and an electron affinity state, or you can call it homo and lumo, when you bring more than one molecule together, you start to get uh, polarization effects, and those band levels move around a bit. They, they come closer together. And um, eventually, you have just uh, a polaron state that is at um, this ionization energy and then at the electron affinity energy. But you have a different gap optically. So this is the electronic gap. We call it the transport gap. And then this is the optical gap. We can also, I've drawn it here. Here's the optical gap, electronic gap. And the difference between those two is the exciton binding energy. So to give you an idea of numbers, typically optical gap would be about 2 eV and maybe about 2.2 or 2.3 for the electronic. So a typical binding energy, E sub B, would be about 0.2 or 0.3 electron volts. Okay. And this describes the Coulombic attraction and polaronic attraction between the, the negative and positive charges um, found in the exciton. So what does this mean um, for the device? Well, when we create our heterojunction, and all these devices require heterojunction, we have a donor and an acceptor, and they must be offset by some band offset, which I've labeled here. So this is the offset between their, their LUMOs. So it turns out that the difference between the LUMO of the acceptor and the HOMO of the donor, which we're going to call the effective band gap of the donor and acceptor couple, uh, that will limit our, our VOC. That's the maximum voltage we can get out of the device. So if you look at some of the current materials we have, the P3HC and the PCBM, uh, this band offset is very large. In fact, it's over, over an EV. And our effective band gap is, is quite small. It's about 0.9. And in reality, the voltage we measure from these devices is 0.6. So we, we take quite a large hit in, in loss of energy because of the band offset. 
but that band offset is necessary to drive the electron reaction um, towards the towards the receptor. So one open question in the field is just how large does that does that have to be? And we don't quite know the answer yet. We could probably make it smaller than one. We have some systems where it is smaller than one, um, but probably larger than about 0 0.4 or 0 0.6 is really necessary. So just some very basic band diagrams, and if you're a device physicist, I apologize that the situation is, is more complicated than this, but this, these cartoons are a good starting point. So we can draw the bands, the homo and lumo for the, the donor, in this case the and the acceptor, on the same diagram, so we merge these two materials. And then in an ideal case, we align up the negative electrode, or we call it the cathode, uh, which is kind of the wrong terminology, but we'll line that up with the lumo of the acceptor, then we'll take the positive electrode and line that up with the homo of the donor. And then under short circuit conditions, where we have to line up the Fermi level, so the chemical potential, then we get a built-in field in the device. So these bands are bent, and the electrons will be driven towards the negative uh, electrode and, positive, and poles in the other direction. Under some bias, and for instance, the open circuit voltage, we can see now the quasi-Fermi levels, that is, the individual Fermi levels for electrons and holes, uh, are split inside the device. And they are split by pumping of photons into the system. Pumping of photons into the system to split these uh, bands and, and driving the potential of these two electrodes apart. OK, so one question is, what effect does that uh, band offset energy have on the efficiency of the device. So what we can do is a very simple calculation of um, using the standard shocking diode equations. So we have uh, the current is defined as a reverse saturation current, G sub S, times an exponential term, which goes as the voltage, minus um, the light current, the photon induced current. So we take that standard equation, calculate um, the fill factor and the short circuit current of the voltage gain efficiency. And we're going to do that as a function of band gap. So you see in the equation for short circuit current, there is a JS naught, which has to do with the defects in the material and the intrinsic charges. And we'll get a current that um, is a function of the band gap, E sub G. We then can plot efficiency versus band gap. And under the, the normal case that would be used for inorganic devices, um, the band offset would be effectively zero. And we get a curve that looks like this. It's the blue curve where the peak is at about 1.4 electron volts, the optimal band gap. And efficiency, maximum efficiency, about 33%. Depends on what assumptions you use, but between 31 and 33%. If you then start to assume that there's a band offset energy loss, you're losing some voltage through the band offset, you can redo this calculation. And you see that this peak number shifts out to the red a little bit, so closer to 1.9. And the maximum value decreases. So in this case, down to 20, 20%. So in fact, that band offset is a bad thing from an efficiency uh, standpoint. And as I said, we don't know exactly how much band offset we need, but we're going to try to minimize it um, for these effects. Um, I'm going to skip through a few slides here. So we've demonstrated this concept of band offset with a donor acceptor system, where the acceptor is, is a magnesium oxide that's been doped. And uh, I'll just say that we can tune the open circuit voltage in a pretty linear fashion as a function of the LUMO uh, of the acceptor. So uh, I'm going to skip that as the time is running a little bit short. I do want to mention a little bit of more recent work um, that's in collaboration with Professor Homelin on uh, some new fullerene acceptors. And I think we'll probably get a little bit more from him about this. And so these are fullerenes that have a fluorine side group on the side. So a little bit complicated for us physicists. It's a fluorine derivative fullerene. And what's interesting here, for me, is What's interesting is that um, there are side chains of various lengths here, of uh, 6, 8, and 10 carbons. So uh, the electrochemical reduction of these is about the same. That means the LUMO position is about the same, meaning we would expect about the same voltage out of these devices, the band offset being the same. Turns out that doesn't happen, that um, you get a little higher voltage with comparing the, the first, uh, we'll call it F6 CDM. You get about, in this case, about 30 millivolts more than the PCDM without the fluorine side group. Uh, you make it a little longer, you get a little more voltage, and then longer, then you start to lose a little bit. But there is this extra voltage that's coming in, into the equation. Uh, in fact, if you do this with other donor materials, and we have at least two other donors that show the exact same effect, you can get much, much bigger enhancement. So what's going on? Well, we don't really know the explanation. But one possible one is a mechanism that's been proposed recently, which is that an important part of the equation is the ground state interaction between donor and acceptor. 
And then if there's more ground state interaction, that JS naught that I showed you in the previous slide goes, goes higher. And that's bad because that reduces the open circuit uh, voltage. So we want to minimize ground state interaction, drive up VOC. So one guess here is that the, those longer outfield chains, the carbon loops, are diminishing this, this effect and giving us a higher VOC, um, just following the same equations. And that, that concept was highlighted in, uh, in a recent paper about six months ago. Um, as I said, um, that cartoon picture I showed you is a very simplistic one in terms of what, where the VOC comes from. Uh, more recently, a um, number of groups have talked about generating the VOC from the difference of the HOMO and the LUMO and adding a term that depends on the recombination. So um, in this equation, we have uh, probabilities for the exotones to, um, to dis uh, dissociate and a conduction band density and a generation rate, and all that feeds into the, the calculation for VOC. So an equation like that is a little more realistic for what the, what the VOC um, would be like. And I'm going to skip through a couple here. Um, just a quick motivation. Why? Well, we have two different types of devices we can consider. Uh, we can take the donor and acceptor and put them just into slabs of material. That's what Chin Peng did at, back in 86. And this makes a device that's very efficient at um, distributing charges without recombination. So in this case, excitons are dissociated at a very clear point in the device. And um, this creates chemical potentials of positive and negative charges that drive the charges away from each other, very limited recombination. Uh, the only problem, of course, is that excitons don't travel very far, and so they have to be absorbed, photons need to be absorbed very close to the interface to create the current in the first place. So that led into the Volcato junction, the idea of mixing, mixing the two components into an intimate blend, where now all of the um, excitons are generated close to an interface, all are dissociated. Um, in this case, though, now all of the electron densities and hole densities are the same. These chemical potentials are the same, so there's no net, there should be no net current from the device. Um, so we really rely now on those built-in fields, that electric field that I showed you, to drive charges in either direction. Um, however, if you, if you don't have a completely uniform device where donors and receptors are maybe pushed a little bit to one electrode, uh, then you can have sort of a combination of the, of the TANG device and the bulk heterojunction device. And probably the most efficient devices we have um, have a little bit of that effect as well. Um, just to touch upon the modeling, so we can make, uh, we can make some sim simple models for these devices where we use standard device physics equations, and uh, we look at a diffusion term, a drift term, a, um, a recombination term, a generation term. And you plug in and you measure, for instance, what photocurrent is generated by the device as a function of thickness. And you get what you would expect that as you make the device more thicker, you originally get more current. But then if you go too high, you start to suffer from recombination and, and it goes back down. So there's some optimal thickness for that, for that active layer. So more recently, uh, people are working on more sophisticated models. So this one was written um, by the group of Paul Bloom in Groningen uh, about six years ago. And uh, we have actually taken that in NREL and are trying to sort of advance, uh, use that as a base and advance beyond it. So it's a one-dimensional steady-state drift diffusion model where we're solving all the standard equations, the Poisson equation, the continuity equation, and um, doing that on, on a lattice where we assume some very simple assumptions that uh, first of all, the, the material is completely homogeneous, so the generation rate in, is the same throughout the device. And that we basically, at this point, have perfect electrodes. So that cartoon I showed you of the electrodes <laughs> in contact with the homo and lumo of the active layer, um, that's the picture we're assuming. Uh, I should say a lot of this work is done by a colleague at NREL, Peter, Peter Graff. So in, in this model, as formulated by, the, by Paul Bloom's group, um, there is a, a kinetic diagram, again back to the kinetics, of the exciton dissociation. And there are rate constants that define what happens to this intermediate state. So I showed you that intermediate state where electron and hole was partially separated. Well, we can define rate constants that go e either to fully delocalized carriers or to the, to the ground state. So you can, you can solve these equations. You can get electron densities in the material. You can get electric field profiles and tell you what's, uh, what's happening in the device. And again, I'm going to sort of buzz through this pretty quickly. But I will show that we can actually um, fit device values and device curves very nicely. So this is some recent data that came from colleagues at NREL using this material. And 
and uh, this is about a 7% material uh, fabricated on a nickel oxide uh, in a calcium electrode. So having the right parameters, we can get a very accurate fit here. And in this case, uh, I've taken mobility values of about 10 to the minus 4, so there's a whole mobility, 9 times 10 to the minus 5, whole uh, electron mobility, 3 times 10 to the minus 4. And uh, a case of F, that's the dissociation rate for the exciton at about 10 to the 5. And you get a very nice, uh, very nice fit. Of course, with 11 free parameters, you, you better be able to fit the curve pretty nicely. So it's important to be able to measure, to measure some of these quantities independently. Uh, with this model, we've looked at the influence of doping. So we can put in some dark carriers into the device at certain levels. And uh, in this case, we see that the, uh, those dark carriers are bad, that they decrease the short circuit current. And uh, what they're doing is basically screening that electric field in the device and hurting the efficiency. So I should warn you that that's not a general result. It really depends on what values of mu and in case of f um, you would look for. And uh, you have some sort of freedom in that, in that position. OK, so I see our chairman is standing up. I'm going to uh, zoom ahead here. Um, as usual, I had uh, quite a few slides for you. But, uh, we are just going to go to the, uh, just that's the end. So that was a 7% device. And uh, can we do better? Well, a lot of groups have predicted that we can get actually uh, to 10%, maybe even to 15% uh, more weights for that article. So he's in the audience as well, I believe. And I just want to walk you through that real quickly in terms of how do we get there. So um, at present, um, we're, we have materials that typically absorb well in, in, the, in the blue, but not so great in the red and infrared. So pushing to more optimal materials, we would ideally get to that 1.4 dB band gap. And um, assuming a fairly realistic uh, collection efficiency of 60%, we should be able to get a short circuit current density of about 20. All right. So the best devices right now are between 10 and 15. Should not be too hard to get to 20. Secondly, if we have that same system that gives you a lot of current, but we can increase the voltage, and we would do that by optimal alignment of the donor acceptor. So here I've taken the case where the donor does have the band gap of 1.4 dB, and I assume a, um, a band offset, a quite small one, of 0.3, then we should get a maximum VOC of about 1.1. <clears throat> let's be conservative, let's subtract 0.3 from that, which is typically the loss we get due to the combination. So we get a VOC of 0.8. And then finally, we have a pretty good device in terms of resistance, and we make that value 0.7 for the fill factor. And we multiply these three quantities together, we get 11.2%. Okay, so that's a pretty pretty clear pathway to getting a higher efficiency um, higher efficiency device. So that pathway is relatively clear. That's no by no means easy, and all these companies and many people in the room are, are trying to do that. Uh, but at least in terms of the device physics, we can write those equations, and, and it's believable. Getting the fifteen percent a little more challenging, not not impossible. Uh, probably requires going to tandem devices, two layer devices, two junction devices that harness different parts of the spectrum. Uh, beyond that, uh, we're probably talking about uh, more exotic mechanisms that are intrinsically capable of breaking the third generation limit, or, or, or the, uh, it's called the shock and the limit. And uh, there's a number of different approaches here, multiple excitons, hot carrier, single fusion, up conversion, uh, intermediate band. So of course, all of these are investigated in laboratory. Uh, none have really been demonstrated in working devices, but there's, there's a lot of promise, um, promise here. So all these are on the, what's called the third generation, which are on the steep part of the efficiency versus uh, cost curve, which is where we, where we want to be. And OPV would be more on the lower end of that curve. So efficiency, not so great, but cost very, very cheap at that um, 30 cents per watt, which would be about $50 per, per meter squared. Okay, so um, I just want to have one, one last closing remark, which is that uh, we're using this synthetic system for harvesting uh, energy from sunlight. Of course, Mother Nature has done this very well for billions of years. And Mother Nature does it with a very complex system, right? So we have, here's a picture of the light harvesting complex 2, uh, which was resolved not too long ago at the University of Glasgow. And uh, if you compare the complexity of this structure to what we have in our materials, it's, it's many of order, orders of magnitude more. So, um, you know, maybe in the long run, we will be able to synthesize very precise materials like this. And also, these systems do a good job of harnessing uh, quantum mechanics. So these systems uh, funnel excitons to a very specific location, special pair, and very efficiently dissociate that, that exciton. So uh, we don't really do that in our systems. We're not using quantum mechanics very effectively. 
So there's a lot of room for opportunity in improving um, the coherence of exotons in our system. So that's uh, all I want to say. I did skip quite a bit of my talk, but it will be available to you as a PDF. And uh, I definitely want to thank uh, all my collaborators, uh, my new institution, University of Denver, uh, several grad students, many of which are working at NREL, and then all my uh, former but present colleagues at NREL and the variety of institutions. And it's, it's really too many to, uh, to list, but um, both these groups have been very important for me. And I um, just want to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to fill any questions. Thank you very much. So, sure. Um, as, as he said, time for questions. Yeah. Your VOC results in the different kind of receptors. Have you actually measured the carrier concentration in those devices at the same elevation? At, at which bias we use? That the VOC condition, whatever like. Yeah, we have it. All, all we have are, are JV curves. So, I mean, the short circuit current densities are a little bit lower in those materials, so the efficiency is lower. Um, I don't know the carrier concentration at DOC or, or at other biases, so that could be, that could be another effect, yes. But so, but the short circuit current is, is less. Right, but at VOC you've got generation minus the combination rate, yeah. so the density will determine in some respect what the VOC is. So yeah. the densities are very different. So that, that's another possible explanation, right? Some of the best results are from the company uh, Heliotech, and I refer that to Maurice Rita, who knows that better. But um, they're reporting in the tens of thousands of hours of stability. So at, at NREL, uh, we have devices that are, that are living of a few thousand hours, but they're completely unencapsulated. Um, they're actually just in air. And it's these inverted devices that I mentioned. So it turns out that silver can oxidize the silver oxide, and that only improves the quality of the electrode. And that if you use an active layer of material, um, like the 7% material I showed you, um, it can be actually quite stable to oxidation. So there's some, there's some promising, uh, promising results. But um, yeah, a, a few thousand hours is typical. Uh, the champion devices are a few ten thousand, tens of thousands of hours. And, uh, maybe I can add something for the Higa Tech device, yeah, these devices we've made. They're glass, glass encapsulated, so really external degradation can be excluded but they are const under constant illumination at about 1.5 sun conditions in a halogen lamp. So, and I think there are six or 7,000 hours now running without signs of degradation. So it's difficult to really put um, an extrapolation there. So the materials intrinsically are, uh, are stable, um, but as Sean said, there are a couple of materials which even outside and the ambient conditions unencapsulated show remarkably light, long lifetimes. Yeah, right now we are using the PCHGF, uh, the student of the studio, but this one is uh, the bandwidth is quite high. So we try to learn the choosing the bandwidth, but uh, when we choose the bandwidth, the mobility is quite low. So what is the main problem of this? How to increase the, reduce the bandwidth and also increase the mobility? Mm -hmm. Well, if I really know the answer to that, then uh, I would show you some better efficiency numbers. Um, but that's been a problem for a long time. In the early low band gap materials, um, the, the, the molecular order is, is very poor, and so and the abilities tend to be very low. The newer, the newer materials, uh, for instance, synthesized by Professor uh, Liu Ping Yu in Chicago, um, the mobility values are just as good as, as P3HT in the 10 to minus 3 range. So, um, I won't say that problem has been solved, but there's, there's a lot of progress on the problem. And the issue is keeping a very planar backbone, so, so no twisting or bending, um, good delocalization of charges down, down the backbone. So, um, you know, there's a variety of molecular motifs that will potentially do that. Okay, well, I think uh, this is a good point to stop. I should thank uh, Sean for a very nice overview. Um, uh, and, um, and now we have a brief 10 minute break